So my school report always said I was easily led. And now I'm leading the way to change the way that we view behavior. And I wanted to share today that I believe there's no such thing as a naughty child, just a child whose needs have not been met. Now, I know that's a really controversial statement to make because we've all been in the supermarket and we've all seen said naughty child screaming on the floor. But I'm still going to say it, there's no such thing as a naughty child. But how can I be so sure? Well, the first reason is I've enrolled on the very popular You're a Parent, Get On With It program four times and reached level young adult. I've also spent over 13 years working with children, studying their behaviour, and I was also a child myself. Now, when I was at school, I was weird, I didn't fit in, I didn't get it, I hated it. I did everything I possibly could to turn attention away from actual learning. Now, in first school, I would challenge myself to go the whole day without writing a single thing. Now, it's amazing how many lessons you can miss by rubbing your forehead really hard and saying you feel sick. But by the age of 12, I'd become a comedy genius, and I'd worked out that if you were really silly, you could get thrown out of the class before anybody realized you didn't know what was going on. And I would use my natural talent for um, drama to my own advantage, and every week, I'd give my home economics teacher a full performance as to why I hadn't done my homework. I didn't like homework, I didn't see the point of it, so I wasn't going to do it. I'd make up great stories of pets and great aunts dying. I also was, I was the Marmite child. People like the teachers either liked me or they didn't. That feeling was mutual. One day, I decided that I was going to memorize the maths teacher's phone number. And it was the day with the phone books, and her surname began with V. Super easy to find. Um, so I memorized her phone number, got hold of the maths textbooks, and I didn't just write her phone number. I wrote Dirty Diane's Dateline, followed by 02392. Actually, I'm not going to tell you her phone number because I got in enough trouble for that the first time around. And there was an English teacher. She was an old-school English teacher. She always wore the same grey knitted cardigan. And there was one particular day, I can't remember what she was talking about, but I just shouted out, this lesson is futile. And that was it. She demanded that I stood up. How dare you? Stand up. Tell everybody what that word means. Well, you can imagine her face when 15-year-old spotty me stood up and went, an absolute waste of time, before I left the room. Now, for years, I'd let... I'd had these words that were sent to me from the ages of 6 to 17. I was regularly told through school, you're stupid, you're lazy, you're weird, you're no good, you're not trying hard. And this narrative just sat with me. And it wasn't until I was in my 30s when I realized that I'd let the words of others define me. And it kind of reminded me of Horrid Henry. Now, we've all seen Horrid Henry episodes. If Henry, Henry isn't horrid, who is Henry? There's one particular episode of Horrid Henry where he gets up really early in the morning, he comes downstairs, and he's watching television. He's watching the telly. And then Perfect Peter wakes up, comes downstairs, and Perfect Peter demands that Henry now lets him watch the telly. Of course, Henry says, no, I'm watching the telly. With that, a huge argument breaks out. Mum and Dad come downstairs, and they scold Henry. Henry, you're horrid. You should let Peter watch the telly now. Now, at no point was there any praise for Henry. Thank you for getting up quietly and entertaining yourself. Henry knew he was horrid. He knew his brother Peter was perfect. And that is a great example of how we treat children and how they will always live up to the expectation that we have for them, be they positive or negative. 
And even now, when I'm working in, in schools, I'm kind of reminded of that. And there was a situation where, not so long ago, I was in a school, and it was spelling test time. Ugh, even now, the thought of a spelling test put shudders through me. And there was a teacher who was trying to get this child into the classroom, and they were saying, he's not coming in, he can't be bothered to do the spelling test. And this little lad was hiding in the coats. So I went into the hallway, got down on his level, and I joined him in the coats. And I said to him, I said, what's the matter? And he, we were just talking, and I told him how I felt about spelling tests. And he looked at me and he said, it's not that I don't want to do the spelling test. I don't want everybody in the class to know how many I got right. So that young lad, his behaviour wasn't about not wanting to do the spelling test. He didn't want to be humiliated in front of his peers. Now, I'll take it back to me, my moment. I left school and I did get all my GCSEs. So who knew? I wasn't as thick as everyone kept telling me I was. And I then spent the next 15 years trying to find where do I fit in? Where do I belong? Yet the narrative words kept going around in my head. You're stupid, you're no good, you're thick, you're weird. And eventually I thought, you know what, I'm going to do a degree. And I decided to do a degree in special educational needs. Now, it was during this degree process, I was actually diagnosed myself as dyslexic and autistic. And it was a real light bulb moment for me because I suddenly realised my behaviour in school was me communicating that I didn't understand. I didn't have a clue what was going on, particularly in social situations. But nobody was able to understand my communication it was easier to throw me out the class, write me off, think of me as the horrid Henry child, than to see that my behaviour was me communicating there was a need that wasn't being met. Now, a few years ago, I was working in a very, very respected school where they had the expectation that the children will work hard and they will do well. There was one particular day Things were not going as they should be. And a young lad was, he was running a right mock around the school. Now, if you've ever been in a school, or if you haven't, there's like a hierarchy of staff that you work through. So you have the teaching assistants, the class teacher, and the senior leadership, and then the head. And you kind of work your way through the ranks when it comes to behaviour, depending on the severity. So the day started with this lad, he was kind of running. It was like a game of tag with the school staff. Let's call him Henry. So the teaching assistants were trying to get Henry back into the class. Henry was having none of it. He was not going in the class at all. So the teacher came out. And I don't know if they learned this at college or what, but the teacher, she used her best cross voice and she used her Mr. Potato angry eyes. But that didn't work. So the next step, they went to senior leadership, and the senior leadership team were called. Now, the other children knew this is serious. It was a bit like calling the A-team. The rest of the class went quiet, and they were all watching what was going on. And there were lots of threats to Henry. If you don't come into class, there will be no playtime. There will be no free time on Friday. The usual stuff that will get most eight-year-olds Toe the line, do the right thing. But what this did with Henry got a lot worse. Suddenly, he was no longer just running around the school. He was saying, I'm going to set off the fire alarms so I can be excluded. Now, when he said that, I knew something was very wrong. I'd worked with Henry for a good couple of years. We had a great relationship based on respect and trust. So at that point, I knew I had to step in. So I got down to Henry's level, and I just said to him, I said, right, take me somewhere you feel safe in school. When everybody else was trying to take away control, I gave him control. Now, I followed Henry, and we walked through the school to the medical room. 
And we sat down on the floor together. And I said, I said, Henry, what do you need to feel better? And it was then he looked at me. He said, I need to get home. My dog is at the vet's. I need to know my dog is okay. I could have cried. A whole morning wasted because no one had asked the question, what do you need? So I phoned mum. Mum phoned the vet. She phoned Henry back. She reassured Henry his dog was fine. She was going to be there at school pickup with the dog. Henry was happy. We spent the rest of the day together. He did all the work that he missed in the morning, as well as the afternoon work. Through his behaviour, Henry was communicating. He was anxious for his dog, but he didn't have the communication skills to have that conversation, to share that. And it's so important that we really start to understand that all behaviour is communication. If we want to build the leaders of the future, we need to understand and be willing to explore that all behaviour is communication. Now let's go back to that child who's screaming at the supermarket. Now, they may well be screaming because an adult has said, no, you can't have that sweet. But the behaviour is communicating frustration, disappointment. The skill that needs to be taught is how to articulate those feelings, how to manage those feelings appropriately. Now, one final thought. If we look at data, government data, of school exclu exclusions in the UK, the biggest reason for school exclu exclusion is disruption in the classroom. Now, if more people, teachers, senior staff, are able to see that all behaviour is communication and that there is a skill that needs to be taught, could those numbers be reduced? Could these exclusions be prevented? So I want to give a challenge to you. When you leave here, and I'm sure there'll be a time you'll come across a Howard Henry, instead of seeing that initial behaviour, take a moment. See if you can really understand what it is that's being communicated, and even better, what is that need that's not being met? Thank you.